So today I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, Viola Ago. Um, she's an architectural designer, educator, and practitioner. Recently, Viola was awarded the Wharton Fellowship at Rice University Architecture, the ESOS Visiting Professorship at The Ohio State University, Knowlton School of Architecture, and the Muslim Chaim Fellowship at the University of Michigan Talman College of Architecture. In addition, Viola was awarded a McDowell Residency at Uni University Design Research Fellowship from Exhibit Columbus and a research residency at the Autodesk Technology Center in Boston. Prior to UCLA, Viola taught at the Rice University School of Architecture, as well as the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, Rhode Island School, uh, Rhode Island School of Design Architecture, um, University of Michigan's Taubman College, and the Southern California Institute of Architecture. She earned her MRC degree from the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles and her BRC from Ryerson University in Toronto. Prior to teaching, Viola was a lead designer in the advanced technology team at Morphosis Architects, working on international built and competition projects. Viola, Viola's written work has been published in Log, Wiley's AD Architectural Design Magazine, uh, Ruth Legs and Stabilities and Functionalities book, Cyarch's off ramp, Academia Conference Proceedings, JAE Journal, Architects Newspaper, Architect, among others. She has multiple forthcoming publications by Wiley, R&D, and Rootleg. Um, her work has been exhibited in Los Angeles, Boston, Houston, San Francisco, Miami, Columbus, Ann Arbor, and Cincinnati. Viola's design research practice, Miracles Architecture, focuses on architecture's role in a world inhabited with forms of duress. Her interests in the effective conditions of war and conflict, written territories, has fueled her investigations towards a design research project that looks at the aesthetic and formal agency of destruction and disorder through methods of perceptual mechanisms. Her architectural project, broadly speaking, looks to political theory and the method of phenomenology of empathy and digital technology advancements such as real-time physics engines and production methodologies. So please welcome with me our first guest speaker today, Viola Agar. Um, okay, well, uh, yeah, thank you again for the introduction and also thank you, Yulia, for the invitation uh, to the summer lecture series. I'm very excited to share my work with you all. Um, I also think that presenting your work in this kind of format um, is really important in terms of um, kind of like reevaluating one's project um, that can at times be developed in isolation. And especially as we were talking earlier during these last couple of years. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, and I will get right into it and let you know that today um, I'll be briefly talking about aesthetics, digital simulations, and politics. So um, with that, let's see. Um, I've organized today's presentation in three parts. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction to describe the framework of my work. Uh, then I'll quickly show three design projects. And lastly, in a, in a kind of attempt to cater to the students in the audience, I'll show some student work um, so that I can illustrate how my design research work as faculty extends to my pedagogical uh, strategies and ambitions. All right, so I'll begin with um, an imperative like, and central theme to my work, which is the experience of conflict as it relates to digital simulation. Um, so what we see here is an attempt um, to a methodology of the philosophical concept of becoming in the world that we live in through what is typically seen as only and merely representational tools in architecture. So to be more specific, here I'm showing my interest in the permutation game of the laws of physics and the laws of memory in an event that is defined, defined by violence and conflict. So as an example, um, I turn to Isle Weitzman's um, of forensic architecture, um, who refers to the egocentric and allocentric perspectives, which are borrowed from the discipline of forensic psychology. So the egocentric refers to the experience as a first person at eye level, um, and the allocentric refers to the experience of oneself as an outsider from memory of relations to things in a scene. So these kinds of perspectives are always really important, completely embedded in the representational technologies or representational techniques in architecture. Um, so for me, utilizing a kind of um, recollection-based system offers a protective apparatus for communication and architecture that is not merely visual, but it's also haptic, it's gestural, it's spatial, um, and something that I'll get to in a little bit more detail in a little bit, um, also empathetic. 
So combining the laws of physics, uh, descriptions of events and relations with things in the round in the 360, um, another important trope in architecture, um, this can productively engage our internal perceptual apparatuses. So that said, my work is interested um, in uh, conflict as a central condition of our present times because it's inextricably, inextricably tied to the built environment, urban complexities, and by extension, architecture. So worldwide conflicts seen in this data here leave a trail of destruction and disarray, and these destructions and, and disarrayment are both visible as in the body and our surroundings, and they're also invisible as in our sort of collective psyche. So I argue for a method of acknowledgement of the destructive world that we live in, rather than kind of ignoring it or putting it to the side or saying that it's over there, it's not here. Um, and I argue that we take seriously the creative potential um, in this kind of destructive world rather than simply ending the story in misfortune. So this is best described by uh, martial theorist Jarius Grove um, in his recent book, Savage, Ecolog Savage Ecologies. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask questions like, can we um, attempt to stand still for a moment? Can we resist our collective urge to put things back together, uh, to put them back together properly? Um, how do we, in a deeply capitalist culture, resist the impulse of pacification? Uh, can we find order in the disorderly? Can architecture gain essentially from the coexistence of collective culture with parts in ruin? So with that background in mind, um, here's the two sort of like streams of my work. So on the one hand, we have aesthetic and formal agency of destruction through methods of perceptual mechanisms. So here we have studies of political theory, phenomenology of empathy, um, experimental psychology and systems theory. Um, and then on the other hand, we have digital technologies, including physics solvers and algorithms, scopic regimes, interactive digital platforms, um, and ultimately advanced fabrication. I'm not gonna get into these like in detail today, uh, but I can briefly describe this framework um, that I uh, described in this article as compositional physics and other diagrams of force, uh, which presents a survey of projects from architects, artists, sculptors, and filmmakers who simply put composed with physical forces, some real and some fictitious. So here I divide the compositional physics project into four qualifying categories in an attempt to renegotiate a refreshed healthier and pluralistic relationship with the digital. But again, um, I won't get into these categories into detail in the interest of time. Um, but I can describe the construct of these four categories that are based on Rudolf Arnheim's and Theodore Lipp's perceptual mimetic psychology theory. So here we talk about visual dynamics and so on. Um, and then in tandem, I use um, CCA's archaeology of the digital program um, as the essential historical reading of the digital in architecture. So at the start of this project, the kind of compositional physics project, um, I resisted a, a kind of polemic position. Uh, so I was, I was depending on that, um, the sort of like the survey mechanism. Um, however, in developing the project, um, as I described in this article here, I started to ad advocate for the compositional physics project in terms of design process proper, um, which is an entirely contentious um, 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 thing in architecture. But again, we won't get into that to do too much detail. Um, so my synthesis is focused on phenomenology um, and uses um, Edmund Husserl's method of the epoche um, and Merleau-Ponty's method of perception. Um, and then in the defense of physics simulations and fictitious environments, I then turn to, um, I would argue, recently rediscovered philosopher Edith Stein and her phenomen phenomenology of empathy method. So the analysis that I perform in that article, for instance, um, and this kind of like ad advocation or taking a, a strong position in design process, um, the article is strictly focused on that, on the sort of like the digital technologies and how these um, technologies can facilitate, but also influence the way that we as designers in an inundated digital world can engage with new aesthetic and formal models um, in a contemporary landscape that is made of pieces and parts. And again, some of these pieces and parts are visibly violent and some are latently so. So um, three projects to follow, uh, which will focus on the use of technology. So simply put, um, I maintain that in architecture, again, we're influenced by technology, and then we in turn influence and create technology to push our work further. 
So um, this is where it gets a little bit tricky for just, just a minute or so. Um, I, I would say that this is um, a little bit more of a denser slide. So we have a kind of oscillation, which you see at the top between technology as a first principle and technology as a utilitarian device. So just a tool, a mere tool. Um, this oscillation, um, it describes an area that's filled with intense frictions. So we have that description in the middle of the slide. Um, and then it's frictions that again are caused by the use of technology. Um, they destabilize our discipline, diversify our field. Um, they add different layers of expertise um, and reveal contemporary problems, which is also very, very important. So in conclusion, these frictions that are caused by the use and the development of technology and architecture or proper, um, it propels us into new territories. And this is this, this level of um, this area of excitement that my work sort of resides in. Um, so in my work in teaching, I'm particularly interested in developing trans-platform workflows um, that ask design-oriented questions through formal and aesthetic registers. So Poppy Red, as you see here, uh, began with an interest in massing strategies that resulted from forces of compression, which is the diagram on the right, um, and graphic conditions that alter the legibility of an underlying form. Okay, so um, these physical studies that you see here show a series of attempts to wrap the 3D form with a 2D drawing from the previous slide. Um, so the object of destruction here, so to speak, <laughs> Um, in this project, it's neither the graphic nor the form, but rather the event. So in looking for deviations from order and slippages between 2D and 3D information, I became interested in the higher dipping technique that we saw in the previous slide. I'll just loop this one. Um, since it's literal fluidity, literally the water that the graphic sits on, um, challenges the, fac the faceted nature of the geometric support. So with this in mind, I turn to digital simulations tools um, to co-op the behavior um, in this project of water transfer printing. So um, here I'm showing the extension of the project in the exhibition format, which I think is another really incredibly important format. Um, so in this exhibition, um, I included all those sort of like the material studies, uh, which were all produced in series um, that primarily focused on animations and simulations. Okay, so that concludes that first project. Um, so here I'm showing the extension of um, uh, the, the kind of that form to 2D graphic uh, project. Um, this is house two, which is from a, from a three house series. Um, so what I'm referring to as the graphic blanket. Um, so the thing that you see on the left um, is the, the kind of the primary um, sort of starting position of the project. So this project is interested in the way that the graphic wraps the form. Um, very similar to Poppy Red. Um, in this example, that wrapping mechanism or that blanketing mechanism is friendlier, um, unlike Poppy Red. Uh, so with this house, I started to become a little bit more interested in fragmentation, so visual and um, tectonic fragmentation. Um, so here you can um, you're going to start to see that fragmentation um, strategy in the cladding system that directly responds to different graphic conditions. Um, and again, these graphic conditions are resultant of that 3D to 2D event. Um, so in addition to the correspondence between the 2D uh, line drawing and the architectural house proposal, um, but also to note, um, and here it's a structural articulation that responds and reacts uh, to the line drawing's boundary. Um, and again, um, we're responding to the line drawing boundary rather than the edges of the 3D geometry. Um, so here in this articulation, the diagram on the left uh, shows five different cladding systems. Um, and then the rendering on the right shows a kind of closer look or an overall closer look at the project um, with some, um, some of the facade systems um, hidden so that to show the transparency aspect or the tectonic aspect of the project. Um, and here is a floor plan and a section diagram of the house um, that blurs that distinction of the line drawings as, as simply a utilitarian device um, but actually it argues for the line drawing as one that is loaded with aesthetic and tectonic value. And in the zoomed in section here, you can start to notice the alignment of the structural system with the penalization system. Um, so therefore these subdivisions produce varied figural and pictorial moments, um, which depend on the observer's position in space. Okay, 
Um, and this is the last project I will show. Um, this is the collaborative project. Um, it's the understory pavilion, which was built for the exhibit Columbus um, biannual exhibition um, in Columbus, Indiana. Uh, so the formal diagram on the right suggests a stereotomic process, um, while the animation on the left shows a type of um, um, systematic assembly approach of panels and parts. So um, fast forward to the fabrication and construction phases. Here is what that diagram starts to look like. Um, so in this diagram here in this drawing, uh, we have all of the parts of the pavilion structure. Um, so we're highlighting here a kind of like a kit of parts strategy. Um, so essentially to the, the pavilion is made of FRP panels, um, which are fiber, re um, fiber reinforced plastic panels, um, which are then embedded in custom CNC bent uh, seal tube frames. Um, so computer numerically controlled um, uh, bent steel tubes. So the intelligence of the project, however, of the, or, or at least the fabrication part of the project, um, rests in these uh, custom-made connections. So we offloaded the unique fabrication aspect of the work um, to a 2D operation, to a 2D cutting operation, which are the water jet flat aluminum fins that you see in the prototype here. So again, 2D operations are um, much more um, efficient than 3D uh, custom connections. Um, so here are some fabrication shots um, taken at the Autodesk field space in Boston, uh, where we use basically um, every machine that was available in the building, I would say. Um, so here we see three axis aluminum milling, CNC two bending, sandblasting, powder coating, water jetting, vinyl cutting, um, and um, some other things that are not, not yet shown in the slide. Um, and also um, really crucial to the project is that the project was generated and controlled using numerical data and algorithmic uh, processes in order to update in real time at any moment uh, that we had a change in material dimensions, for example, or any other um, surprises, I'm gonna call them during the fabrication phase, which is uh, more often than not the norm. <laughs> um, so again, the only geometric input for this project was the original uh, surface shell that you saw in the formal diagram. Um, so here, here we are on site assembling uh, the pavilion with two research assistants. Um, so we would assemble each panel flat uh, and then connect it to the rest of the pavilion um, on site, as you can see in the background. Uh, so lastly, from a design perspective, um, I also want to point uh, to the way that the um, offset edges weave views of the interior of the pavilion with views of the Denk highly designed landscape um, beyond, and it kind of creates different types of visual and aesthetic experiences. Okay, so to conclude, I'll just slide through some student work uh, in order to briefly describe how my design research as a pedagogue extends to the classroom. So here's a kind of index card of classes um, that I've taught at both the undergraduate and the graduate levels um, in a few different schools um, that you heard in the introduction um, that I've had um, the opportunity to visit and teach at um, through um, the kind of like architecture design research and teaching fellowships. So for example, in the seminar here, I introduced my students to robotic motion and asked them to use um, the line as a motion path um, and as a design tool that can control how these designed forms hit a graphic chemical water bath. So back um, to that hydro dipping technique that I described earlier. Um, in this next class here, um, I had my students project uh, texture mapped um, so already texture map 3D primitive geometries into two and a half digital canvases. Um, then the students selected um, one of their studies and developed full assembly systems and constructed these large scale prototypes that you see on the right. Um, so this is a true forceful uh, domestication of digital processes that absolutely do not belong to our physical space. Um, and this is from a design build studio that I co-taught at RISD where the students were asked to uh, primarily rationalize uh, graphic projections and graphic projection techniques. Um, they were asked to design connection parts and panels. Um, and also perhaps more importantly in a, in a design build project, um, they were asked to, uh, to prepare fabrication files and to, to uh, take care of the management process. Um, so this is not unlike the pavilion project that I just showed um, a few minutes ago. All right. Um, so then um, the studio um, here was called Plastic Systems and asked students to think through um, the method of cerebral plasticity through the lens of the philosopher uh, Catherine Malibu. 
um, this class here was interested in perceptual destabilization. Um, so again, returning to the compositional physics project. So um, student here, for example, uh, used the ground, an elevated parallel slab, uh, and objects of agitation in order to, to achieve a composition of coherence and incoherence, or that kind of flickering between the two. Um, so the work um, originated from a series of simulations uh, that was taught in a previous class uh, that attempted to generate formal and compositional logics um, of controlled and um, I would say like intentional destruction. Um, and again, here I want to go back to the ego. Egocentric and allocentric. Um, so there's two different kinds of perspectives, one from the eye level and one that is made up from the relationship between parts in a scene um, that, again, are in disarray, but also uh, can at moments come together in, in a kind of like visual coherence. Um, and then I'll just let this play out a little bit longer. So uh, we concluded this pedagogical endeavor. Um, so this is kind of like the experimental part, but um, this was also associated um, with an installation of an exhibition of the simulations, the drawings, animations, um, and the physical models that the students produced. Um, so we see in here. Okay, um, and then this was a, was followed by um, the first of a two part symposium which focused on compositional physics project broadly speaking so again with these kinds of works. Um, it's very important to invite um, outside thinkers and speakers uh, to participate in the conversation. Um, and then the second part of the symposium took place uh, during remote teaching, um, and we had to kind of like um, update the format accordingly. Um, so the second part um, expands on relevant discussions. Um, also with invited guests. Um, in this case here, uh, we had film studies theorist Aubrey Annabelle join us um, for an in-class discussion, um, and then we had a digital presentation um, of some of these discussions. Um, and I will end here um, with a work in progress. So this is house one from the house series. So you saw house two, this is like the kind of like start of that. Um, this also attempts to architecturalize, um, again, uh, more extreme um, conditions, more frayed conditions of those kinds of events that I was talking about between the graphic behavior um, and again, the graphic behavior in the form. And again, we'll, here we're talking about the kind of like the natural and the synthetic or the allocentric and the egocentric or the real and the fictitious. So sort of like balancing somewhere um, in between these two. Um, and here is the kind of um, an elevation render to describe um, that this sort of or highlight rather the visual uh, forceful frictions between graphic and, and form. Um, and again, all this work uh, attempts to kind of recall that earlier proposal, uh, which is an architecture that's rooted in aesthetics, uh, simulations, and politics. Um, and I will end there. And I hope that that was between 15 and 20 minutes. <laughs> I think I might have gone a little bit over. Thank you so much, Viola, for such an amazing presentation. Our next guest speaker today is Katie Chu. She is currently working as an associate at WorkPoint Engineering, a structural engineering company here in Culver City. She was an architectural designer at Kevin Daly Architects and a graduate research fellow at City Lab here at UCLA AUD. Katie received her bachelor's degree in structural engineering with a minor in fine art from UCSD. Katie went to do the MARC program here at UCLA AUD as well. Katie has participated in a wide range of projects, including multifamily, custom, single family houses, educational projects, in addition to commercial buildings. Please welcome with me, Katie Chu. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So, hi, everyone. My name is Katie Chu. Um, I'm an architect and a structural engineer uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, thanks for having me. It's nice to be back in the jumpstart environment. Um, I was actually a jumpstart kid, um, maybe a bit over a decade ago after graduating. Like my intro said from uh, engineering, I got my bachelor's and then enrolled in jumpstart before getting my master's in architecture here at UCLA. Um, so full circle, it's nice to be back. Um, today, I think this talk will mostly focus on the work I currently do as a structural engineer. Um, but more importantly, I'd also like to broadly, you know, talk about the relationship between uh, architecture and structure, having experienced both um, in design and in practice. Um, so I guess a little background on structural engineering. Um, structural engineers are basically tasked with taking the conceptual design from the architect 
and making it stand. Um, simply put, I think, you know, we work with different materials, uh, different vertical lateral systems, you know, to withstand everyday forces such as gravity, uh, wind, seismic, um, but also, you know, to ensure that the design or the project is really performing as it was intended. Um, I think you guys, especially when you're taking something that you kind of modeled in Rhino or kind of drawn on paper and you're translating that into a built work, uh, that's a significant process. And I think, you know, it involves a lot of coordination between architects and engineers. Um, and so I think, you know, here on the screen is just a plan comparison of a multifamily project we're working on. Uh, the left is architectural, the right is structural. And I think placing the two side by side, you know, you really can start to see the information that overlaps, but also the information that um, is unique to each project or each discipline, sorry. Um, and as you guys are kind of starting out and coming to realize that hopefully that structure and form are really uh, forever intertwined in design. Um, I think as future architects, you know, just being, not only being aware of the structure that exists in your projects, but also being able to work with it and not against it um, will make you better designers overall. Um, so I, so the first thing we do um, as architects, right, with a new project is uh, you kind of go through the programming phase. It's kind of when you figure out, um, you know, who's the project for, what function does it serve, um, you know, just basic programming. And I think during this initial phase, uh, structural engineers are often also figuring out uh, what, what's the weight we're going to support, um, you know, given the program. So this is a slide. Um, so the, okay, so I guess the weight of what we care about is called live load. Um, live load is basically the weight of occupancy um, and it's expressed in pounds per square foot, uh, PSF. So this slide is actually a group of students illustrating the concept of live load. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys heard that term before, but basically it relates to the occupancy of, of the weight of occupancy. So on the left, you have 50 PSF, which would be uh, similar to like a residential building, single family homes, um, office space use 50 PSF. The middle is 100 PSF. So that's more of your retail, if you're designing a store, um, a lobby space for hotel, you know, any amenities building. Uh, and then the on the right is 150 PSF. So that's public um, assembly. So if your project is open to the public, um, someone can walk off the street and kind of onto your project. Um, we as structural engineers would be theoretically designing for that many people uh, in that amount of space. Um, and so kind of just using this slide as a nice introduction to kind of kick off, you know, the classic form versus function conversation, um, but also kind of to highlight, you know, that architects and engineers are really working within the same parameters. Um, we're kind of just approaching problems in different ways. Um, so I'm gonna try to stick with that theme, I think, as we move through the rest of the lecture. I'm gonna go through a couple projects I worked on. Um, and then I'm gonna to try to highlight kind of moments in which the design directly impacted the structure and vice versa. Um, so here's the first project. This is by Hatch Architects. And then we did the structural engineering. Um, this was a, an existing church that was renovated into three live work units for some artists in Pasadena. And it was also to serve as a gallery space. So the main structural scope here was really just removing the ceiling, pretty simple. Um, when you have these pitched roofs, I think, you know, very common in architecture, uh, the roof itself actually kind of has this tendency to slide off the wall, uh, just given the angle at which it was constructed. And so it's actually holding the roof together is the ceiling, the ceiling ties in tension. Um, so here the architect wanted to remove the ceiling completely, kind of open up the space. You can see how much, more height uh, we gained by doing that and then um, kind of introduce some skylights to get some natural light into the gallery. Uh, so we proposed these series of trusses that kind of kind of pierce through the space. Um, you can see here and it's a good way of exist, uh, bracing the existing uh, roof. Um, so I think here really the idea was to go as simplistic as possible, um, kind of use the least amount of structural moves to really open up the space. Um, the trusses themselves were also exposed. So of course, you know, you take extra uh, care for detailing these connections. Um, and then the trusses themselves were also custom. Um, so they're made of flitch beams. Uh, flitch beams are two wood beams that are sandwiching a steel plate in between. And we went this direction really to just kind of follow the language of the existing roof. So the existing roof is all wood and it was going to be left exposed. And so we wanted the trusses to kind of read as wood, 
uh, but we needed to retain that uh, additional capacity with that steel plate uh, kind of concealed within. Uh, so just a photo of the construction kind of in progress. You have two steel columns in the middle. Um, they kind of act as this axis of symmetry uh, in which the trusses are then kind of mirrored about, um, creating this very nice balanced um, symmetrical uh, plan. And just a photo of the kind of the completed work. So I think here you can kind of see how the trusses nicely blend in with the roof. Um, all the wood was left exposed in efforts to kind of contrast this with the very white gallery walls. Um, for the artists. And I think, you know, overall this project is just a nice, simple, elegant way of um, kind of resolving what otherwise would have been accomplished by a ceiling or a soffit, um, using structure kind of in a more expressive manner uh, that also promotes the program. Uh, second uh, project is by Kevin Daly Architects. And then we did the structural engineering. Um, this is a single family house in Venice. This is actually one of my favorite projects. Uh, because um, as the intro mentioned, I actually worked for Kevin for about two years after graduating and focused on the design of this house. Um, and then when I moved to WorkPoint uh, Engineering, I actually picked up the structural design of this residence as well. So kind of cool to see, you know, uh, from working on both sides of the design, um, something that's built. Uh, so this was in Venice. So typical Venice is kind of long, narrow lots. Um, so this is the side elevation of the project. I think it's the most revealing. Uh, the first floor is all concrete and the second floor is all wood. And I think the driver kind of for that, for the materiality and the structure here was really the unique shape of the building. Um, I think you'll see in these upcoming floor plans, like the floor plate at the second floor is very asymmetrical, very curvilinear. Um, so it's kind of decided early on that we would use concrete. Um, concrete's very form finding, it's very easily shaped. Um, and then supporting that concrete slab were concrete walls uh, across the entire first floor. So this is the first floor plan, um, structural. And you can see all the concrete walls. I really like this plan because it's so minimal in the way that it frames the rooms. Um, you can see there's very little kind of door partition infill framing here. Um, it kind of lets the concrete piers really just do the space making. Um, and the other thing I like about this is there's really no dominant structural grid um, that you might see um, kind of in a building frame system. And that's because uh, concrete slabs, uh, when you're designing for below, um, concrete slabs are very uh, strong biaxially. So they're very strong in both directions. Um, and this gives a lot of leeway to the designer when you're placing supports below. Um, you can kind of shift them in and out of plane um, as opposed to kind of adhering to a more strict column grid that we're, you know, we're typically used to seeing for kind of post and beam structures. Uh, so here's a photo kind of the completed work. Uh, this, I really like this photo because it's kind of harmonizes the structure and architecture here. All the concrete walls are left exposed. Um, if you look at how the windows and doors are framed, they're either framed full height, kind of top to bottom um, slab or kind of cut out um, kind of in the concrete themselves. And then another photo of the kitchen. Uh, here you can kind of see that um, underside of the exposed slab on the second floor. Uh, I think there's two moments kind of in this project where the concrete walls kind of start to do their own thing, kind of take on their own shape. Um, and it's really at the planter and at the stair. So we're looking at the planter here on the left. And in both instances, um, the wall, the concrete wall kind of starts to lean out in elevation and kind of gets projected out. And it's also turning the corner. And it's turning the corner kind of in this conical, uh, very radius manner. And what was interesting about this was that it was a board form concrete project. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with board form, it's basically a term for casting concrete in which uh, you're intentionally imprinting the concrete with the pattern of the formwork. Um, so typically you kind of use thinner two by members um, to create this repetitive striping on the concrete base. And so you can imagine, you know, when you get to a wall that's kind of leaning out in elevation and also turning the corner at a radius, um, it kind of gets quite complex um, pretty fast. So we actually were involved, you know, working with the architect and the contractor to kind of retain the integrity of the formwork, of course, but also to uh, make sure the pattern, you know, came out really nice and clean. Um, so just a good example, I think, of the fabrication, structural integrity, and design aesthetics, you know, really coming together and kind of creating one final result um, that I think turned out quite nicely. 
And then here's the roof of that project. Um, it's a pretty funky shape, but it's an undulating surface. So it is a ruled surface and it's consisting of exposed LVL wood joists. Um, because the wood joists were exposed, I mean, extra care was kind of taken towards the layout of the joists themselves. Um, and here, when I say joists, I mean these uh, gray slanted lines, and that's basically um, the roof framing. So it's very atypical for a structural engineer to show the exact location of joists in a project. Uh, but here it was actually necessary because everything was exposed and we needed to kind of call out all the detailing right where it hit the supports below and make sure it was very clean. Um, and then the other thing that I think is interesting about this roof plan are these skylights. Um, so I worked on this actually on the architectural side at Kevin's um, and they're kind of just chamfered corners out of the roof um, and they create these really funky kind of eyelid profiles. Um, let's see, yeah, on the left, you can kind of see the bedroom with the skylight and then there's a close-up of the skylight on the right. Uh, these were made with just a custom steel vent tube. Um, and then here's those joists I was talking about. Um, they're all exposed, kind of framing in. So just a couple more photos of the project. Um, on the left is left, so the left is second floor, uh, kind of walking down the stair. You can see the concrete slab is exposed. And on the right is that concrete stair I was talking about. And I like this photo because it's kind of a contrast between the cooler concrete with the warmer wood framing above. Uh, third project is a small lot subdivision project um, by Batoni Architects, and we did the structural engineering. Small lot subdivision, um, let's see, that is a term in development where you basically buy one giant piece of land and then you subdivide it into smaller plots of land. Um, so on each plot of land, then you're able to build an individual unit that's actually structurally independent from all the other units. Um, and I think this is really popular in LA right now because, you know, we're going through this housing crisis and small lot subdivisions are a way of kind of promoting uh, dense living, but also it promotes home ownership. So uh, this project was 12 units, uh, six on each side of a communal driveway. Uh, on the right is a construction photo, very typical for California residential projects. It was all constructed out of wood um, and you have a gravity uh, kind of steel moment frame at the bottom, framing that garage opening. Uh, each unit is four stories tall and they each have a unique floor plan. Um, and let's see, okay. So then what's really complex about small lot subdivisions is the separation between units. Um, so because like I said, they're all structurally independent um, and the developer you know, wants to pack as many as they can on a site, you get these really small separations between units. Um, you can see how this could be challenging in Southern California, given kind of the seismic zone. Um, you see these two units are kind of swaying back and forth. They will hit each other. And so you have to make sure to minimize that drift. Um, here was particularly interesting because each are four stories tall and um, they're all made out of wood. So wood is very flexible. Um, and I think you can imagine something you know, the taller it is, the more, and the more flexible it is, the more it will sway back and forth, as opposed to something that's maybe shorter and more rigid. Uh, so we went with four and a half inch separation uh, between the units. So on the left is kind of a closer look, and then the right is two unit plans. Um, because the project was made out of wood, uh, the primary lateral system here was wood shear walls. Uh, okay, so wood shear walls is uh, basically a wood stud wall. Um, and it's sheathed with plywood on each side. And so the plywood is the main shear resistor here. And so it gives it a lot of rigidity to the wall. Typically you don't notice these in architecture. I mean, they just kind of fit within the plan layout. But I think you'll notice here, we actually had to double this system given how close these units were together. And so you see in the back line, I think of the plan and kind of in the middle, there's actually two walls back to back and which implies four layers of sheathing. So just doubling the stiffness, doubling uh, the system. Um, and I think, you know, this is just a good example of how something like a structural concern can kind of translate or maybe bleed into the architectural design. Um, and so how the two are kind of working with each other and can easily work against each other. Um, but, you know, this was caught early and the architect wanted to keep this project out of wood. So he was very receptive to using these double walls. They're essentially about 12 inches thick now. Um, but I think, you know, it came together quite, quite nicely. 
Uh, last project I will talk about, um, this is a community center. We did, it's kind of a, like an outreach uh, after school program for children in South Compton. Uh, Frank Gary was the design architect and then the executive architect was Shiat and company. And then we did the structural engineering. Um, so typical Gary fashion, I think, you know, you have these cubes, kind of these different boxes of varying volumes, varying heights, and they're kind of aggregated together to form uh, one building mass. Um, so this is the structural plan, the second floor. Uh, you can start to see those boxes, right, and plan and they start to rotate. And as they rotate, um, you know, they kind of create these different classrooms and different kind of study rooms for the children. Um, but they also create this really interesting interior moment. Um, it's kind of a cutout of the floor plate. And it's actually this interior courtyard you're able to kind of walk around and view, you know, above and below. Um, I think given kind of the rougher neighborhood of where this was, I mean, this is kind of South LA, South Compton, and the fact that this uh, project was for children, um, you really wanted to make, the design intent here was really to try to make it open and transparent. Um, so I think it was decided pretty early on we would be using steel for this project. Um, not only to like easily frame the complex geometry we just saw in plan and also the varying heights of all these different volumes, but um, it allowed us to go with a slender, kind of more elegant lateral system. Uh, and so you actually can see that here in this bay, it's an SCBF, which is a steel concentric brace frame. Um, and I think just looking at that, um, you, can, you can tell the difference between that and right, an opaque shear wall, right? So kind of just um, choosing the right material, choosing the right um, lateral system that kind of lends itself towards the design intent here. Uh, and then just an image of the inside. This is on the second floor, uh, looking onto the interior courtyard. And here, I just wanted to point out kind of all the natural light that's coming through, lots of glass. It's a very warm, kind of welcoming building. Um, lots of use of warm colors. You can kind of see the boxes kind of rotating in the middle. And then that same view uh, during construction on the first floor. So this is just looking at the steel uh, framing. Um, we use composite steel metal deck. It's a very thin kind of metal pan corrugated with concrete. Um, and I guess the one thing I just want to point out in this photo is kind of how, if you look at the first floor brace frames, they're kind of disappearing into the back. And if you imagined this picture, maybe out of a concrete or wood building, um, you would get a lot of a, a much different read of the building, I think. You'd get a lot less light coming through. I think your floor plates would be a bit thicker. Um, if this was wood, you'd probably have a couple additional columns, you know, dropped occasionally. Um, and then here's just the view looking in the opposite direction on that interior courtyard. And I think what was interesting here was kind of this third floor mezzanine. Um, given that this was for children and they're kind of be running around the whole space, um, we really didn't want to drop too many columns on the second floor to kind of support that third floor mezzanine. And so what we ended up doing was actually just suspending it uh, from the roof. Um, so you see these very long columns here that run from the floor all the way up to the roof they're actually supporting that third floor. Uh, on the left is the construction photo. We're standing on the second floor and you can kind of see this third floor terracing and it's just being hung by uh, steel hangers. So by doing this, we were able to avoid any columns on the second floor. Uh, and then on the right hand side, it's just kind of a close up of that detail. Um, and I think if, you know, just comparing to wood or concrete, you'd probably get a, a very different read very different moment. Um, I don't even know if this would be achievable. Steel is very good intention. So, um, but overall, you know, I think this project was really good example of just kind of choosing the right material for your design, kind of being in tune for what the architect was kind of chasing after with their design, and then trying to match that uh, with materials, with your lateral system. Um, and I think that is it. Uh, so I think I made time. I might have been a little over, but hopefully that was you know, helpful for you guys, you got something out of it. Um, maybe at the very least, you start envisioning how your future projects will be built uh, in the future. I think, uh, so one one of my main ambitions for this lecture series was to give the TNARC and Jumpstart participants as much insight into the diverse field of architecture. And I think I couldn't have paired more diverse 
characters today and in terms of your work being very very differently situated I think yours Viola is more situated in the pedagogical academic realm and Katie's is more in the I would say uh, built construction um, I would say on the everyday basis uh, how you kind of proceed and work um, so I think that gave like a really good insight into into uh, both of your of your works. I have a personal question for you, KD, what I want to uh, kick off the Q&A with. You did personal a lot, question. Yes, you did a lot of uh, technology seminars with me when you were a student at UCLA. And we were doing similar, like the, what Viola showed a bit in her lecture, we were doing a lot of work with robotics, uh, the concrete casting, the composites. And I'm just curious in which way you were very engaged as an MR student in the MSAUD program and those technology seminars. Um, one of the few ones actually who took all of these um, opportunities to do the technology seminars at Ideas. And so I was curious in which way looking back, you think those technology seminars had an influence on your um, way of going about projects, materialities, and so on? Or if you think back and you're like, oh, yes, I did those, <laughs> they weren't relevant at all, you know, so kind of that could be also an answer. But I'm just really personally really curious. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it was a big stepping stone taking all those classes. Um, in a, in a certain way, it kind of offered a realism to design. I think with your classes in particular and in using composites, you're instinctively thinking about structure, right? Because the structure in composites is the actual material. So, you know, you can corrugate it, you can fold it in certain ways, but I think especially in composites and kind of what we were doing with robotics and the ideas campus, just really combine the two of structure and form, you know, cause they are essentially one and then Actually, when I went and worked at Chrysler and worked on the SF MoMA for the composite panels, um, that's really when it kind of hit where it was just like, wow, you know, structure is like so important, you know, because I kind of took a kind of veered off and kind of took a detour after graduating, you know, with my uh, bachelor's. And so it was really nice to kind of come back into it, but look at it through a different lens. Um, a lot more appreciation, you know, for the value of structure and then how inherently it's just kind of part of the form. Um, also highly recommend Julia's class. I don't know if you're still teaching it, but it was great. I took every one I could. Different sure. ones, different ones now. Oh, okay. Just as good, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah. I think we can fix the audio issue. We were logged in twice. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, Simon, would you like to ask yeah. the first question? Uh, um, so hi Viola, I had a question for you regarding the kind of the hydro dipping of the textures. Um, I kind of was wondering, I've seen people use a couple different um, materials. What kind of material do you use for hydro dipping and like does it immediately stick to the surface or does it do you guys use some sort of like adhesive? So that's um, hmm. um it, it doesn't have um, a very uh, clear answer, I would say. Um, it is a very tricky process. Um, and again, like I want to maybe express like a caveat at first, which is um, I'm not attempting to get like the most precise um, kind of um, a print or um, attachment of graphic onto a form. Um, I'm actually interested and curious in the process, determining uh, some of the aesthetic uh, conditions of that, of, of that kind of crashing mechanism of, um, of the form into the water bath. Um, so there's a particular, so in terms of the, that's the, that's the sort of like the ambition, but in terms of the technical part of it, um, there's a particular film um, that you print, you inkjet print on, so you can't use a toner printer. So there's already the kind of um, um, another sort of condition in the process. Um, and then you use a chemical that dissolves um, the ink and the film um, in the water bath, and then you dip uh, the form into that water bath. Um, now that's the sort of like the, 
the setup as it's taught, right? Like the, the kind of like the textbook process. Um, with some of the work that I was doing, um, I was using flatbed printing. I was using um, UV cured inks. Um, I was using uh, kind of like uh, masking mechanisms where I was like spray painting certain parts um, and then printing on top of that um, and then using that to so you know so I started to deviate um, from the process as like at, as the textbook process in order to see um, what other uh, aesthetic conditions um, that particular process could offer um, because it's not uh, hydro dipping is not an architectural uh, I can't even say that um, it hasn't necessarily been uh, sort of explored in architectural scales. Um, although there are certain projects that I would uh, that I would argue that have been uh, working in similar um, frameworks. I think um, I don't remember the name. Maybe Yulia can help me with this, but it's an early cool panel block project. I think from like the '80s with like the quartz and steel panels that are the facades with the black. Um, kind of like tar um, <laughs> um, graphics um, on on the court. I don't seals, know that one. Yeah, I don't remember the I don't remember the name because I'm it's um a more of a photographic memory type of person. But um, in any case, so so these these kinds of like um, graphic to form translations, um, we've been working with them for a long time in architecture in terms of articulating like surface conditions and things like that. Uh, but again, like I want to point to this. Um, uh, to using the process, kind of like taking it as it is, and then slightly altering it so that it so that you can learn from the process and you can also get the process to behave in a, in um, in a design way that you're interested in, right? Um, but anyway, there's a film and there's a chemical spray uh, that you absolutely need, and then you can add on top of that. Great, thank you. And then we have a question from the audience as well. Uh, so. Uh, Kate, I have two questions for you. Uh, so one, what is it like working with different architecture firms? Are there different processes that go into engineering buildings from firm to firm? And do you as a structural engineer come in at different points in the design process? Ooh, that was like four in one. Okay, um, I'm gonna go backwards because I just remembered the latest one. So we come in, the sooner we come in, the better, I would say. Um, if we can get in on an SD level, like uh, right when they're kind of massing out the building, um, we would uh, love to be in when you're choosing your materials because we would love to, a lot of projects, we just offer three different models. And what's funny is we actually work in Rhino a lot. Um, a lot of the skills I learned at UCLA, we, you know, we're using, so we're rendering um, out of concrete, out of steel. And like, which one do you want? Which one, you know? And then let's see, the, what, are your, what was the first question for the first two? What is it like working with different architecture firms? Oh, right. That's a, that's a funny question because the more you work with them, the more you kind of develop their personality. Um, so I think if you compare just the projects I showed, like you have the Frank Gehry project, right? Which is like a bunch of boxes, just like, you know, combined together, kind of rotating different heights. Like they don't care. Like you just have to come up with your own structural thing. Um, but then if you're working like with Kevin Daly, you know, that was immediately like we were doing the formwork design on that, you know, so definitely architects are different. Um, there are different depths at which you kind of get involved, um, which is pretty interesting. And I tend to kind of like working with the smaller firms, to be honest, just because I think the one to one scale, um, also the relationship between structure and architecture, personally, I think is a lot more visible at a smaller scale. Um, when you get larger, you're kind of just working with systems. Um, you know, but great question, thanks. I think it's exciting that you showed these two architects projects because with Jumpstart, we went to visit uh, Kevin Daly's office. Oh, you and did? With, nice. Yes, and with Teenark, we went to um, Frank Gehry's concert hall in downtown. Okay, so cool. I think the students kind of know now the architects and what you're talking about, which is really great. I think. Oh, that's great, yeah. I didn't know that, nice. So then my second question was, what is your favorite type of structure to engineer, residential, commercial, or public spaces, and why? Ooh, love it. Um, I would say high-end residential, to be honest, because you have these like crazy clients and their money is their own. So a lot of times we do these like crazy houses out in Venice and you just kind of get these wacky people, right? And they just want to do concrete, steel, like whatever. And it's like half a sculpture, half a house. Um, 
So it really puts the, the uh, pressure on the structure for sure, because you're really trying to make it you know, really clean. And then you have all these exposed details. Um, it's really much more custom design. Commercial, you kind of get into um, developers and you know that whole mess of a system, but the one-to-one -one with you're working with the client um, is really nice. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, we have one in the chat and another one in person. Um, All right, so my question is for Katie. Um, I just want to know, you're a structural engineer, so is there at any point where during a project you just stop and let the rest of the architects do the work or do you just stay with the project and just watch it the entire way through? I would actually argue we get more involved later in the project and the architect kind of like pieces out um, towards the end. So it's kind of, they're very heavily in creating the building mass and you know, the SD schematic phase. And then we're the ones at the end, like going on site every week, looking at the details, you know, making sure everything kind of pencils out. So it's actually, I think we put more time into the building towards the end and the architect kind of steps back. I think they go to site, you know, maybe once or twice, we go about 10 to 15 times, just like looking at everything. So by the end, I, I would argue almost, we have almost a better relationship with the, the actual building. And then from the aesthetics point of view, when the interiors come in and all the cladding, uh, then we kind of step back because that's not really our field, but that it's a really good question. Yeah, we try to stay in it the whole way through, but we definitely get way more involved towards the end um, with all the connection detailing and all that. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to thank you both for speaking today and for everyone that came up and asked a question. We all enjoyed it here in person. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Katie and Viola, for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule and joining us. I hope you have a good summer. <laughs> and um, yeah, if, uh, if you... Um, yeah, no, I just want to thank you for your time and uh, and uh, insight. It was very interesting for me also to see what you're working on and uh, how you're both doing. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks so much thanks for having you. me.